Okay. Um, can you hear me well with the microphone? Is that okay? Um, so so what, I, what I thought to do is I um, tell you two stories. One story we have done on cell cell adhesion in development, and the other one on cell migration. I think I have a total of one and a half hours, right? In one and a half hours I have uh, at time. Okay. Um, I can point only at one of these screens. Which one would be more convenient for you? Where are more people on this side? Okay. So, okay. I agree. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. So, so, so um, I'm a uh, developmental biologist, um, you know, with an interest in, in sort of biophysics and cell biology. And what um, I would like to do in the first slides, give you a little introduction into the uh, um, model organism we are um, working on, uh, just to uh, give the physicists uh, a bit of, bit of background on um, uh, the, the model organism we, we study. Now, what we are interested in is a process in um, development which is called gastrulation. And it's essentially early embryonic development. And the organism we are looking at is zebrafish. And what you have here on the <coughs> left side is a zebrafish embryo which is approximately three hours old. And it consists of uh, a thousand cells sitting on top of a very big yolk cell. And the, the type of morphogenetic process we are trying to um, understand in the lab since now 15 years is how you transform this cluster of cells into something which looks like a proper embryo, which has a head structure, a tail structure, an anterior posterior polarity, a left-right polarity, which you can't see really, a morphological visible polarity, and a dorsal ventral polarity, which is obvious in this uh, uh, picture here. So essentially, we are trying to understand um, the transformation of this cluster of cells into something which looks like an embryo. Um, I put this movie in for the ones, and probably everyone who has seen a fish embryo has seen this movie already, but some of you might not um, have seen a fish embryo. So I put that in here. It just shows you what gastrulation is about in a uh, dynamic movie here. And it starts essentially at the onset of zebrafish life. Um, the first cleavage has happened up here. It's a partial cleavage, which subdivides the blastomeres up here. And this is uh, the yolk supply of the fish. And what is happening in the first 10 hours of development shown in this movie here, you have initially a number of cleavages. It's just subdividing the volume of the initial zygote up here into smaller parts. And um, this is uh, leading to the formation of the blastoderm. The blastoderm consists out of a thousand cells. And morphogenesis sets in now. The blastoderm starts to spread over the yolk cell. As you can see here, you get mesoderm and endoderm cells to the inside. It's one specific type. And these ectoderm on the outside, you have convergence and then you have extension of the body axis. I just run it one more time. Um, initially, it's a simple uh, cleavage process where you subdivide the volume into smaller parts. Then you uh, um, have the, the blastoderm and morphogenesis, proper morphogenesis sets in now. The blastoderm spreads over it. It's called epiphyly. You get ingression of mesoderm and endoderm uh, cells. You have convergence of cells towards the dorsal axis and extension of the body axis. And this is really essentially um, these different processes which you have seen here in, in the movie is what we, what we are trying to understand in the lab. Um, I put in the, these schematics here just to summarize a few of the key cellular events during uh, uh, gastrulation of the uh, fish embryo. And um, it starts here on the left side. This is the onset of gastrulation, approximately three, three and a half uh, hours old. And then everything runs very quickly. This only takes seven hours, and then they are um, basically done, right? I mean, that's, that's very quick if you compare it to uh, humans or um, other organisms. And um, um, just in the schematic diagram, you can see down here, the, the first type of movement, as I um, you know, mentioned before, is spreading. It's tissue spreading, essentially. And what, uh, what, what happens during tissue spreading is that you reduce um, the uh, thickness of the tissue along one axis, and you extend the tissue along the remaining two axes. And this uh, process of epiboly, as it is called, is um, presumably driven, and I will talk about that tomorrow in a bit more detail, um, it's driven by two different processes. One is uh, a spreading of an epithelial cell layer on the outside, which is called the enveloping cell layer. It's sort of a skin surrounding the blastoderm. And that undergoes active spreading. So um, it's a squamous epithelial cell layer, which undergoes act active spreading. At the same time, you have to redistribute these deep cells below. And, these, and the way they are redistributing is undergoing radio intercalation. Essentially, that cells deep within the blastoderm move up into more superficial layers. You thin the tissue along its radial axis, and you extend it along the remaining two axes. Okay? And the coordination between epithelial cell layer spreading and radial intercalation of deep cells is what epiboly is about. And I will tell you tomorrow and in my second lecture how um, this process is being regulated. Another very important type of cellular rearrangements in gastrulation is essentially setting apart the different uh, germ layer progenitor cells. And you have three different types of germ layer progenitor cells, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. 
And usually in an embryo, ectoderm sits on the outside, then you have mesoderm, and then endoderm is on the inside. And you have to segregate these different uh, cell types into distinct layers. And the way that the, the fish embryo is doing it, it's um, you, have an, you have induction of mesoderm and endoderm progenitor cell fates in these marginal cells here that comes from a signal which is residing within equatorial regions of the, the oocyte as a localized RNA being translated into a protein acting on these marginal cells and then using mesoderm and endoderm cell fates. And once these cells are becoming mesoderm and endoderm, they undergo something which is commonly called an epithelial to mesenchymal transition. Um, with uh, saying that with some caveat, because these cells are never completely epithelial. They have pseudo-epithelia, but they don't have an epical basal clarity. But what these cells uh, do is they become more mesenchymal, more migratory, and response to becoming mesenchymal and migratory, they're moving to the inside and forming the mesendoderm germ layer on the inside, and the cells which are not ingressing are the ectoderms. So you are basically forming out of a uh, single sheet of cells, you should form a double sheet of cells with mesoderm and endoderm on the inside and ectoderm on the outside. And um, while these cells are going to the inside, you start to accumulate cells on the dorsal side by movement of cells from lateral regions and ventral regions over to the dorsal side, where they are accumulating, undergoing medial lateral intercalations as they are arriving at the dorsal axis here and thereby extending the body axis. Essentially, you know, these cells are streaming towards the dorsal side, they are meeting, they are undergoing intercalation, and then you are extending the body axis. Very, you know, very simplistic. Uh, that's the way how, how it works. Okay, so, so in, in the first part, what I um, would like to speak about is how the different germ layer progenitor cells are segregating within the embryo. How do you set apart uh, mesoderm and endoderm from ectoderm, essentially? Why is mesoderm and endoderm going to the inside and ectoderm stays on the outside? And in a, in a, I put this high magnification to photon laser scanning microscopy movie in here and showing you the uh, process of ingression of mesoderm and endoderm cells right at the germic margin in this little window over here. And um, what you might be able to see is cells moving into the inside, migrating up in this direction here, and these are the cells which are in the boundary between ectoderm and mesoderm would be right here, along here, as you can see. And interestingly, once you know these mesoderm and endoderm cells go, go to the inside, you would not find a single cell which ever goes back into the ectoderm. So there's a complete segregation. You can, you can track all these cells. You don't find a single cell which would ever go back into the tissue they are coming from. And it's a quite interesting process because if you look at the morphology of these cells, they are, you know, very superficially, they don't look much different from the cells up here. There's no basal lamina or any other sort of structure which se um, separates these two tissues, but it is a complete separation between two tissues. You have ectoderm on the outside, mesoderm, endoderm on the inside, and there is no intermixing. And what, what we are trying to understand is how this segregation and separation is functioning, how mesoderm and endoderm cells are completely segregating from ectoderm cells, and what maintains their separation, because there's no structure which uh, physically separates them. Now, um, what we did is to understand this process um, in a bit more detail, is, um, and, and that's something we are typically doing in the lab, is we um, go away from the complexity of the embryo. We are taking cells out of the embryo, primary progenitor cells out of the embryo, and we are trying to see what they can do in a, in a sort of self-organizing manner in culture, and then we try to translate what we are finding into culture back into the embryo. Now, what we did is, in this case, we took out ectoderm cells and labeled them in red, and then um, um, mes endoderm cells and labeled them in green. Single cells, we, we basically dissociate the embryo, and we take mesoderm and ectoderm cells different, differentially labeled. And then we are mixing these progenitor cells and putting them in different wells, and we are asking, would they be able to self-organize in distinct layers, right? And the process of what is happening is, if you're putting them into culture, um, is illustrated here. You, you can see very nicely that the ectoderm cells go to the inside, and the mesoderm and endoderm cells seem to surround the ectoderm cells. But there is essentially, in, in this process, there is a complete separation and segregation of these different um, progenitor cell types in culture. And this is self-organized. There is no MB or anything which gives some external cues or anything. This is a self-organized process here. Yeah. I will come to that, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly what we are trying to understand, is what makes these cells different and how uh, do their differences. Ah, OK. Uh -huh. So ectoderm forms skin and nervous system. And mesoderm and endoderm form muscles in the digestive tract, anything which is on the inside. Digestive tract is endoderm, and muscles is more mesoderm. Yeah. So, 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 
Um, sorry? They are not differentiated enough to actually you being able to, I mean, so one can't differentiate. Ah, so, so you can not, dis I mean, if you look at morphology, it's very, very hard to distinguish between ectoderm and mesoderm, and you have to look at marker genes here. So you cannot, I mean, you know, morphologically, you cannot, they are not differentiated cells yet. Okay, I'm saying there is a possibility that, you know, probably they're all the same. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. So how, um, do I, how do I rule out that melanoma? Okay, okay I, I, I mean the experiments. Okay, so 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 you think there's a spontaneous, you know, segregation of cells, which yeah. I'm just saying that they're all the same. Hmm. There's a moment going on, huh? and after about one point, there the one that obviously differentiates. Ah, okay. So yeah, yeah, exactly. So 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 in this uh, in this segregation, we know that the green cells are already mesoderm when we're putting them into culture, so they're expressing mesoderm. A typical genes characteristic for mesoderm cells, while the red cells are expressing genes characteristic for ectoderm cells. So they are already different cell fates at this stage when we are starting. So fate specification is not a result of, their, of some sort of segregation, as you have suggested. Yeah, yeah. Um, in the embryo, it seems to be if you look in transgenic embryos, which are you know driving GFP under the promoter, under promoter typical for mesoderm and endoderm, you would see that the specification actually happens earlier than their ingression. So specification is actually likely causing the ingression rather than the ingression causing the specification. OK, so, so but you know, the, the, the basic question then is, you know, what makes them different and why do they segregate from each other? And um, what we thought to understand that is um, we um, turned back to old studies by Steinberg and colleagues, which, um, uh -huh. no, this is OK. Which, and you, you're probably aware of that, that um, um, a standard, um, proposed that tissues behave like um, in liquids, immiscible in liquids in this case, which have a given surface tension. And what we speculated based on these studies, and, and there are a couple of other studies on xenopos and, 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 and amphibian uh, gas relation, um, that possibly ectoderm has a different surface tension from mesoderm and endoderm. And since these tissues have different surface tensions, they might separate from each other based on difference in surface tension of these tissues. So um, what we um, basically we followed up the hypothesis that there might be a differential surface tension which causes tissue segregation, and that the tissue which has a higher surface tension, in this case it would be ectoderm, goes to the inside and is being surrounded by tissue with a lower surface tension. There's some sort of heterotypic adhesion between between mesoderm and ectoderm, right? Okay, that, that was the idea, and um, so, so what we wanted to know is if the um, ability of um, ectoderm aggregates of cells. Um, to form a very cohesive cluster with a high surface tension is different from mesoderm and endoderm aggregates. So we wanted to compare how, how cell cell adhesion um, in homotypic aggregates is being established in the different germ layers to see if there's any difference in surface tension and if this difference in surface tension might then drive segregation of these germ layers. Right? So, so what, we, what, we, what we did is we even simplified the assay by not looking at, at very many cells, but looking at the smallest possible tissue you can look at, which would be two cells contacting each other. And we are basically comparing them to ectoderm cells um, in comparison to two mesoderm cells and to endoderm cells and try to find out if the ability to form a, uh, a cohesive cluster of cells um, enlarge their cell-cell contact area if they have different uh, 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 different potential in, in, in doing so between ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. OK. So, so what we did is, and this is what we did together with Frank, who is in the audience, and yeah. Can I increase the volume? I'm not sure if I can. Um, I can put that up, perhaps. Let's see. Do you think, is that better? Yeah? I can try to speak a bit louder, but I have a cold, so, but I can try. Uh, tell me, can you understand me in the back? Any problems? No? OK. Um, OK, so, so what, we, what we thought is we are looking at uh, these doublets of cells, and we are comparing ectoderm doublets to homotypic ectoderm doublets to homotypic mesoderm and endoderm doublets. We are looking um, at these doublets in the formation of a cell cell contact um, as a function of the interfacial tangents um, which would exist in su such a doublet. And we assume there are two different types of uh, uh, tangents, interfacial tangents. One, one is called by uh, the actomizing cortex, and the other one is an adhesion tendon. And basically, when we're looking at uh, a doublet which has a, um, a stable uh, morphology, then we would assume that these tensions are um, in equilibrium here at, the, at these contact points or the, the contact line. 
round the cell cell contact, and we assume that uh, the morphology would then tell us about the distribution of the interfacial tendons here, right? And um, what we are comparing here is an, an cortical tendon at the cell medium interface on the outside, a cortical tendon at the cell cell interface, and an adhesion tendon omega, which goes in the opposite direction, because the adhesion tendon tries to increase the cell cell contact size, while the cortical tendon at the cell cell interface tries to reduce the cell cell contact size. So they are opposite to each other. And then we have these two um, cortical tendons at the cell medium interface. OK, so, so what we wanted to do is then we wanted to, um, to see um, how the morphology of ectoderm versus mesoderm, endoderm ductlets differs from each other. And we wanted to see, uh, wanted then to measure these cortical tendons and eventually arrive at the adhesion tension and see what's, you know, is there any uh, difference in the morphology? Is the difference of morphology due to differences in cortical tension and or adhesion tension between ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, because we, we assume here a specific adhesion between these. And this is cathedral mediated cell cell adhesion we're assuming happening between these cells. Right. So if you wouldn't have any adhesion molecules, they would not form any cell cell contact. Uh, gamma CM would be here the cortical tension at the cell medium interface. Okay. Or the surface tension of these uh, cells. Okay. So, so the first thing we did is we uh, looked at the morphology of. Um, Ectoderm doublets versus mesoderm and endoderm doublets is a function of contact time. And what we measured is the contact angle, which uh, I indicated before up here, uh, the angle theta, this one here. And this is then independent of the volume of these cells. And um, what we find is, if you're looking um, at the contact angle, that ectoderm has a higher contact angle over time than mesoderm and endoderm doublets would have, indicating that the contact size, ectoderm or ectoderm cells, are more able to form large contacts than mesoderm and endoderm cells would be. Right. Okay, so that indicated already that ectoderm, and that's consistent with the idea that ectoderm aggregates uh, um, have a higher surface tension than mesoderm and endoderm aggregates, right? Okay, but, and then we want to measure these different entities to see um, what contributes to this difference or what causes this difference between ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. And um, the first experiment we did here is we used an AFM microscope. We put a plastic bead onto the cantilever. And then we did a force indentation curve by pressing the, um, the, the bead onto the surface of single progenitor cells to measure essentially the cortical tension at the cell medium interface, right? And we did that for single, progenitor, single ectoderm progenitor cells versus single mesoderm progenitor cells and endoderm progenitor cells. And what we found is that ectoderm has the highest gamma CM or cortical tension at the cell medium interface followed by mesoderm and endoderm. And uh, as a control, we um, uh, interfered with uh, myosin-2 phosphorylation and loose activity, and therefore actomyosin cortical tension. And we arrived at very low cortical tension in all these three cases, which is indistinguishable, indicating that uh, ectoderm has a higher cortical actomyosin-dependent uh, surface tension on the outside, gamma CM, than mesoderm and endoderm. Right. Then we wanted to see, um, we wanted to go from gamma CM to gamma CC, the cortical tension at the cell cell interface. And the way we did that is an experiment which uh, Jean Leon, a PhD student in the lab, came up with. Um, um, and what he did is he um, uh, created this triplet of cells here. This would be a homotypic triplet con containing either three ectoderm or three mesoderm or three endoderm cells. Um, he holds them with two pipettes on these outer cells, and then he pulls on one of these sides here. And then they're separating either here or here, right? And once they're separating, I can show you the experiment. What you see is that this cell deforms at the former cell cell contact site, right? And this deformation is an indication about um, the difference in cortical tension at the cell cell versus cell medium interface. Assuming that pressure is being homogeneous within the cell, it deforms to an extent which reflects the difference in cortical tension between the cell medium interface and the cell cell interface here. So by looking at the deformation in the different triplets, ectoderm versus mesoderm versus endoderm, we can learn something about the ratio of cortical tension at the cell medium versus the cell cell interface. And once we have, since we have measured uh, the cell medium interface in the FM experiments, we learn something about gamma CC in the different progenitor cells. Do you understand what says that there is a delay? Which delay? Uh, before when it, uh, you pull for like it takes about 15 seconds until the cell deforms. Uh-huh. 10 seconds. Yes, it's not instantaneous. That's right. true. Yeah. Um, 
honestly, we have not really thought about it. Uh, I mean, there could be, I mean, the whole thing, yes, I mean, it should instantaneously be formed, but um, I mean, sometimes what we are seeing is that there are um, tethers between these two cells, and I'm not sure if they would explain why that is actually that interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Ah, the medium on the outside is just a culture medium, so it's EMEM F12 in this case. It's water. Assuming that the embryo would have interstitial fluid, which has the same composition as water, then you know that would be an equivalent, you know, situation. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I show you more evidence what is actually happening at the contact of the adhesion molecules, if I can actually, yeah. yeah. I, will, I will come to that, to the adhesion molecules and the redistribution of adhesion molecules during the separation process. Yeah? Can I what? The viscosity? Of the droplet? Of the cells or the droplet? The, the cells? Ah, in the medium? The medium is water. Let me see here. I'm not sure why that is looping. Okay. So you're asking about the viscosity of the medium? It's water. It's just water. Essentially, it's water plus some supplements in there, some proteins. Yeah. It will take some time because it has this, you know, push the water. Away, right? Yeah. I mean, that could partially you know, explain the delay, I guess, right? Yeah. Okay. So, so what we what we essentially arrived then here is a measurement of the, so we directly measured the uh, cortical tension at the cell medium interface. We derived the cortical tension at the cell cell interface by the ratio of, of these two cortical tensions here. We have the morphology and the contact angle here, and then we can derive uh, the uh, adhesion tension. We can do that for ectoderm cells versus mesoderm cells and endoderm cells. And what we find out and um, what is common to all these things is if you compare the adhesion tension to the cortical tension at cell medium interface, the adhesion tension is very, very small, indicating that what has been assumed as one of the key functions of adhesion, expanding the cell cell contact by providing a negative tension here, is actually only marginally contributing to the shape of these doublets here. What really matters is the ratio of cortical tension at the cell medium to the cell cell interface. And here it seems to be that this ratio is going to be smaller if you compare CC over CM, gamma CC over gamma CM. This is smaller in ectoderm cells compared to mesoderm and endoderm. In, in, in simple words, what uh, ectoderm cells do is they uh, um, uh, have a higher cortical tension at the outside to start with, and they uh, disassemble the actomyosin cortex to a very low level. And in mesoderm and endoderm cells, you start with a lower cortical tension at the cell medium interface, and you do presumably uh, disassemble the actomyosin cortex to a similar degree. But the ratio is, is going to be different then, because you, you start with a higher cortical tension in ectoderm compared to mesoderm and endoderm. So what really sets apart mesoderm and endoderm cells from ectoderm cells is the degree of cortical tension um, once these cells are starting to fuse. And then what adhesion is doing is disassembling the actomyosin cortex via a process which I, which I will come to and, and leading to, um, uh, to uh, reduction of uh, gamma CC at this interface here. Okay. And the adhesion tension is, is marginal. So you said that there are certain gene markers which you can uh, describe by sodium yeah. So do they have some sort of uh, besides the central cytosine? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yes, I mean, if you look at, um, you can look at uh, actin and myosin 2, and you see that myosin 2 is stronger localizing to the cortex in ectoderm compared to mesoderm and endoderm. Act, uh, mesoderm and endoderm cells are being uh, induced by nodal TGF beta signals, and what we uh, speculate here is that nodal TGF beta signaling reduce cortical tension in these progenitor cells in a very global way by probably interfering with myosin 2 phosphorylation activity and thereby actomyosin contraction. So it's, it's, it's thought to be an adhesion tension, which is uh, leading to contact expansion, right? So it should, you know, it should point up to, as, as indicated here, right? That would be omega here, because it's extending the contact. There would be a negative tension in this case. 
And the idea is behind this negative tension is that adhesion molecules are staggering up and they are extending the contact by forming sort of aggregates of adhesion molecules which, which extend the contact. That was one of the ideas. But if you look at the localization of adhesion molecules, you will see immediately that this is actually not the case. <coughs> yeah? Ah, okay. Ah. Okay, so, so you think they, they look different from the, I mean, it's the, this is just the ratio here of gamma CC over gamma, gamma CM here, and this is um, omega over. But um, you mean that's different from what we have seen here? It's the same values we are using here, right? Yeah. Ah. Yes, I think we have, yes, I mean, I think they are, di they are different, significantly different here, the ratio here. Okay, so, so what we conclude from here is um, the difference in cell cell contact angle and those, uh, the surface tensions between the different pretender cell types is predominantly determined by the different ratios of cortical tension at the cell medium versus the cell cell interface. So it doesn't matter, um, you know, the, in the, the original assumed function of adhesion molecules extending the contact seems to be uh, not the dominant function here, but it seems to be um, adhesion molecules reducing cortical tension at the cell cell interface, which determines how big the contact becomes. Uh -huh. Okay, and adhesion tension only marginally contributes to cell-cell contact formation. Okay, so, so then we were asking, you know, what are adhesion molecules doing in this process? I mean, one function I indicated already that they must induce to a certain degree by a signaling function that must lead to the disassembly of the actomizing cortex at the cell-cell contact, okay? But um, what we wanted to know is then how the strength of the cell-cell contact is determined and what the function of adhesion molecules might be in, in, in uh, determining the, the mechanical uh, strength of cell-cell contact. So what we did is to determine the cell-cell adhesion force between two cells is we took pipettes again. We're taking one cell here, we're taking another cell, then we're putting them together. We're leaving them together for a certain contact time. And then we're trying to separate them again by aspirating this cell, this increasing step by increasing the pressure in the pipe here. Okay. And then that once we are reaching a critical pressure, we can actually separate them. And this gives us then uh, the separation force, which is a function of the diameter of the pipette and the pressure which is applied, the negative pressure in the pipe, which, which we apply. Um, so we can measure the deadhesion force in homotypic doublets for ectoderm compared to mesoderm and endoderm and try to find out if the larger contact we are seeing actually in these relates to a stronger contact than a mechanical more rigid or you know, more difficult to separate contact in, in these events. Yeah? What is the that are the Ah, yeah, yeah, the, the waves you're seeing. This is um, essentially BLEPS, and I will come in my second part today, if I will arrive there, um, and explain how um, these blep-like protrusions are happening in these cells. And these are sort of traveling, they're, they're called circus movement. It's a, it's a blep-like protrusion which, uh, uh, which travels around the circumference of these cells. So a dissociation of the plasma membrane from the cortex, and then it's being pulled back on one edge, and it travels on the other edge. Okay, but I will, I will show you a, a better picture. Okay, so here we're looking at the separation force, and we're looking at the separation force as a, a function of contact time. Again, we are going up to 10 minutes here. And we are comparing ectoderm doublets to um, endoderm and mesoderm, mesoderm and endoderm doublets. And what we find is that in ectoderm doublets, the contact becomes stronger as a function of time, while the contact becomes also larger. In, interestingly, in mesoderm, contacts, the, contact, uh, the, the contact strength, so the separation force, becomes weaker. And in endoderm, it's, it stays pretty constant, but it's weaker um, than mesoderm initially and ectoderm over the full period of time. So we thought initially, perhaps, you know, the, the contact strength is just a function of the contact size. And, you know, if you're assuming you have a homogeneous, uh, you know, the, the same density of adhesion molecules at the contact, it could simply be that if the contact is larger, it's harder to separate because you have a larger contact. So what we did is we um, normalized the separation force by the contact radius to see if that is explaining why we are seeing a difference. And still, if you're looking at uh, the separation force divided by the contact uh, radius, that ectoderm is larger than mesoderm and endoderm, indicating that the size of the contact alone cannot explain why these contacts are so much stronger in ectoderm compared to mesoderm and endoderm. So we wanted to find out what else. And one, you know, the, the most intuitive uh, explanation, yeah? In this case, we normalized to the radius, actually. But um, we assumed it's going to be round, the whole thing. But we have. Um, so, 
so the radius should scale with the area because we assume it's a, it's, it's a, a circular contact in this case, right? But we have not subdivided by the area, but we could do it by the area as well, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 I, I come to that, I come to that. Yeah, the Cartierans are gonna be the, the next. So, so what, we th what we thought is, you know, if it's not the, the size of the contact which makes a difference, it might, might be the density of adhesion molecules, Cartier and adhesion molecules at the contact which might, might be different. Assuming that ectoderm would have more, perhaps expresses higher levels of cartierin than mesoderm and endoderm. So what we did is we looked at the amount of cartierin at the plasma membrane using a antibody against all classical cartierins. And what we found, which was uh, you know, counterintuitive at this stage, is that it appeared, if you're looking here right in the embryo, uh, the mesoderm would be on the inside and ectoderm on the outside. And if you look at the amount of cartierin at the plasma membrane, uh, mesoderm and endoderm seem to have more cartierin at the plasma membrane than ectoderm. So opposite to what we thought, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the, the cell which has a weaker contact actually appears to have slightly more cartierin at the plasma membrane. So, so the, the amount of cartierins cannot, difference in the amount of cartierins cannot explain by ectoderm has a mechanically stronger contact than mesoderm and endoderm. Okay, so, so we wanted to know what determines the, the, this high contact strength in ectoderm. <coughs> and what we did is we looked at the, a very simplified version of the adhesion complex between two cells. And in this you know, stripped down version, it would consist of uh, cartier and adhesion molecules, which bind to beta catenin. Beta catenin binds to alpha catenin, and alpha catenin links into the cytoskeleton. So you're uh, coupling the two cortices of these cells via this link of consisting of alpha catenin, beta catenin, and cartier, right? And then we thought, you know, how strong is there any difference in the strengths of this chain uh, between ectoderm versus mesoderm and endoderm? And the way we want to see how strong that is, is pulling on it and seeing where it ruptures and if it ruptures earlier in, uh, let's say, mesoderm than compared to, to ectoderm, right? Okay, so, so what we did is we uh, did an experiment. First, we looked at the localization of these different components. And what we find here with an ecatherin antibody is that um, most of the ecatherins are localizing actually to the cell cell contact edge, which I'll show you one, one more time. And this is exactly the point where the two cortices are actually need to be attached to each other, assuming that the actomizing cortex is largely disassembled at the cells of contact, right? So the adhesion molecules in this complex localizes where you need to mechanically actually link these two contractor cortices uh, from the two contacting cells. And then we did, uh, we looked also in vivo and, and, you know, right in the end, and you can very nicely see that, you know, all these rings, in this case, it's beta catenin, but you have, you know, this is a very nice localization of beta catenin right at this ring, like at the edge of the cell cell contact. So you don't have a homogeneous distribution of adhesion molecules, adhesion complex over the cell cell contact, but everything sort of localizes to the edge of the cell cell contact. Okay. And then we did the experiment, which I told you before, if it will come. Okay, um, let me go back. Okay, so now we are looking here at two cells. Um, I hope you can see that. Can we, um, can we put the lights down? Is that possible? Perhaps not. Oh, yeah. This is good, yeah. Perfect. Um, so, so you might be able to see these two cells here, and they're expressing an, an, a version of n cartierin which is the p tagged and n cartierin localizes to the cell cell contact at the margin of the cell cell contact. And we wanted to know when we are pulling on it, where would n cartierin end up? Does it stay, you know, is it separating at the, uh, you know, cartierin cartierin binding, and then you would have it essentially in the two separating cells, or perhaps it rupturing further downstream, and then you would have it like in the middle between these two uh, separating cells, okay? So that's the experiment. We are pulling them apart using pipettes. And you see very nicely that n cartierin floats. Now they're, now they're being pulled. n cartierin goes right. And then you have it at the base of a plasma membrane tether which connects these two cells. OK, so n cartierin is not just staying behind where it was before at the cell cell contact edge, but it sort of flows and it ruptures, as presumably it ruptures the, from the actomyosin cortex and flows into this plasma membrane tether or in the base of this plasma membrane tether. You can see it a bit nicer. If you look at beta cartierin GFP, again, you are separating these two cells. And then you have a tether in between these two cells, and you have a blob of beta catenin right in the middle of this tether here, indicating that you pull out cartierin plus beta catenin, and they flow into this tether, and you leave behind, presumably, the actin uh, cytoskeleton. If you're looking at alpha catenin, it looks different. You're separating them, and alpha catenin essentially stays back where it was before. 
Now you pull it apart, but you don't see alpha catenin really at a tether between these two cells. And similar, if you're looking at actin using a eutrophin peri, actin doesn't go into these tethers. These are plasma membrane tethers which are not filled with actin, right? So, so uh, from these movies, the um, so why is actin only one It should be in both cells. So actin yeah, is. It's in both cells. I mean, both cells have an acting cortex. Oh, why do you say it's reaching only in one cell? Because I don't see that. Oh, you don't see actin in the other cell? Okay. No, it should be in both cells. I mean, this is just an imaging artifact here. Okay. Oh. I'm not sure what's my That's so crazy here. OK. Um, let me quickly go here. OK, so this is just a, you know, a quantification of what I tried to tell you from these movies is if you look, this will be the contact before the separation, and then it is completely separated with the contact radius during the separation process. Uh, and if you look at uh, catenin and beta catenin, you can see that uh, they go right, and they're accumulating at the uh, you know, diminishing cells of contact till they are in the tether, right? While if you look at the concentration of alpha catenin and actin, um, then this is not happening, right? They are just staying where they were before, right? They are not changing their localization during the pulling process. So, so it uh, appears as if uh, the weakest link in the catenin medium coupling between these contractor cortices appears to be between alpha catenin and beta catenin. So if you pull on this thing, it breaks between alpha and beta catenin. And what we then conclude also is that this, uh, you know, this linkage must be, or presumably, is stronger in, e in, in ectoderm cells compared to mesoderm and endoderm cells. And that explains why ectoderm have a mechanically stronger contact compared to mesoderm and the endoderm. This is just showing you that this is not just a culture artifact. We're looking within the embryo, and again, we're looking here at NCAT here, and I can run this movie once more, if that works. And you can see nicely that NCAT here and goes into these terrors between two cells. You can see it here nicely for days. So that's something which happens within the embryo. So. This is a or a... These are mesoderm cells within the embryo expressing NCAT here and GP, a fusion of. Um, we have looked at the ectoderm as well. The problem is that ectoderm doesn't move so much relative to each other, so it's hard to see tethers really because they're very packed and you know, it's harder to see what, what happens. Yeah, so so ecto mesoderm and endoderm migrate approximately 2 micrometer per minute, and ectoderm perhaps 1.5, 1 micrometer. And, and they're, but they are moving in opposite directions as well. So one moves up and the other moves down. So, that might, like, so they get enough time to. Aha. Uh -huh. So you're thinking about you're thinking about heterotypic adhesion now between ectoderm and mesoderm, or you're thinking about homotypic adhesion? So we have not looked at heterotypic adhesion between ectoderm and mesoderm, or ectoderm and endoderm. What we are doing here is yeah. Yeah. Ah. Okay, so, so would be the speed of separation in vivo be similar to the speed of separation we have in our experiments here when we are putting them apart? Is that the question? Because they have this sheer flow end. Ah, okay, yeah. And from the other and they seems like it's stretching too far. But you are asking how ectoderm cells move relative to other ectoderm cells, right? Two mesoderm cells, and you're assuming there's some heterotypic adhesion between them, and that would lead to some <coughs> transient contact formation. We have not looked at heterotypic adhesions at all. We are just looking here at homotypic adhesions. So we are looking only at ecto, ecto, meso, meso, and endo. We have done some initial studies. It seems to be that if you're looking at a heterotypic adhesion between ecto and meso, it falls um, for cortical tension, and the ratio of cortical tension falls between what ectoderm cells are doing and what mesoderm cells are doing. It seems to be more dominated by the weaker cell than by the strong cell. So the weaker cell limits probably the adhesion strength. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why is the coupling equivalent between alpha coloring and beta <coughs> coloring the weakest? Why? Um, why? Why is it the weakest? I mean, presumably the, the, the binding strength between alpha and beta catenin is weaker than between uh, alpha catenin and catenin or between alpha cat catenin and you know, some molecules which link into the cytoskeleton. Um, that's a molecular interaction. And you know, I think it has been reported, binding affinities have been reported. And I think there are conflicting reports in the literature. Some of them would indicate that the binding strength of alpha to beta catenin is weaker than the binding strength of alpha, alpha catenin to the cytoskeleton or beta catenin to catenins. 
<coughs> okay, so we did one experiment to see actually if uh, this binding strength is, is meaningful. I mean, we are speculating now that ectoderm has a, a stronger anchoring strength to the corticocytic skeleton than mesoderm and endoderm. Presumably, we are having a stronger alpha beta catenin interaction. And what we wanted to know is if this binding strength matters for ectoderm forming larger contacts than mesoderm and endoderm. Is this binding strength uh, important, right? And the way we want to interfere with the binding strength is, is in a very drastic manner. What we do is we take a catherin adhesion molecule and then we are cutting off their cytoplasmic tails. So they have still a plasm, uh, transmembrane domain and they have an, an, an extracellular domain, but they don't have a cytoplasmic domain. So they can essentially not couple to the corticocytic skeleton. What we then want to do is we want to take out the endogenous catherins, full-length catherins in ectoderm cells, as well as in mesoderm and endoderm, and replace them with a truncated version, right? And then see if they all have the same truncated version. They all would not be able to link to the corticocytic skeleton. Would ectoderm still form a larger contact than mesoderm and ectoderm? And that would sort of indicate that the binding strength into the corticocytic skeleton is meaningful and required for ectoderm forming larger contacts. Okay, that's the experiment. And um, that's what we did is, and um, this is just illustrating what we, and, and you know, just look at this here. Here we're looking at the separation force in the upper one, and we are looking at the contact angle or contact size in the lower one down here. And what we compare now in the control experiment is you take out the endogenous version of Cartier and replace it with a full length version of Cartier, right? If you replace now e Cartier with a full length Cartier 2, and I can explain why we are using Cartier 2 and not Cartier 1 in this case. Then what um, happens is that ectoderm cells form a larger cell cell contact angle compared to endoderm cells. If you replace the endogenous now with a truncated version of Cartierin 2, then ectoderm forms a similar small contact than endoderm. So the ability of ectoderm forming larger contacts depends critical on the anchoring ability of Cartierins to the cortex cytoskeleton. Similar, if you look at the, uh, I said here, the, this is the separation force, and this was the contact angle, and that's exactly the same down here. Interestingly, you still have, in the case of you know, the truncated version, you still have some contact forming, indicating that there perhaps are other cartierins which we have not knocked down in these cells and which might mediate some residual uh, cell cell adhesion in these cells. Okay, then we want to know <coughs> if, you know, in case we have the truncated version and the cell cell contact is approximately the same between ectoderm, so ectoderm doesn't, isn't different anymore to mesoderm and endoderm, would that affect their segregation behavior and culture, right? And that's what we did here is uh, looking now in a control experiment, you uh, mix uh, ectoderm and endoderm cells and you get a very nice uh, segregation usually. And if you use that truncated, if you um, uh, take this truncated version, this, the seg segregation of these pretender cells doesn't work anymore. Okay, so what we conclude here is um, <coughs> that e here and mediated adhesion mechanically couples the contractor cortices of contacting pretender cells. That um, the coupling strengths of e here and scales with the cortical contactivity of the different pretender cell types and determined by the cytoskeletal anchoring strengths of e here. Meaning when you have a very strong contractor cortex, you have to make sure that the, the coupling strengths of the cartierins actually scale with the cortical tendon in these cells. You have to, you need a very strong coupling strength to hold these, uh, and, and so, so you, you, you need a, a stronger coupling strength in ectoderm compared to mesoderm and endoderm. And the difference in pretender cells and contact formation cells often depend on the side level anchoring of the cartier. Okay, so, so just to summarize it, what we, what we think is um, um, the, uh, the reason why ectoderm segregates from mesoderm and endoderm is partially determined by differential surface tensions of ectoderm compared to mesoderm and endoderm. The differential surface tension comes from, you know, the fact that ectoderm forms in homotypic ectoderm clusters form larger cell cell contacts and more stable cell cell contacts than mesoderm and endoderm. And the mechanical strength and the size of the contact critically depends on the anchoring strengths of ecatherin to the cortical cytoskeleton. So they need to be uh, rigidly coupled to the cortical cytoskeleton in order to allow um, uh, ectoderm to form large cell cell contacts. Yeah. Okay. And there, there is, I mean, perhaps we can discuss it probably, you know, for a longer time in the evening, but there, there are lots of different ideas how the Cartierin complex actually anchors to the actin cytoskeleton. Um, 
some people um, assume that alpha catenin uh, exists in two forms, in a dimeric form and in a monomeric form, and only the, the dimeric form can actually bind to the corticoscytoskeleton. In the meantime, this model has been changed, and now um, what is generally believed that alpha catenin even bound to beta catenin can directly bind to the corticoscytoskeleton if the actin filaments are pre stressed. Now, what also has been assumed is that alpha catenin, when bound to beta catenin, the monomeric form cannot bound the, um, directly bound to the actin, actomyosin cytoskeleton, but it can do so via linker proteins like vincolin or eplin or other proteins which bind to alpha catenin and then link to the cortical cytoskeleton. But, you know, we can discuss what the evidence is. But, you know, either it directly binds or it needs other coupling molecules to bind to the cortical cytoskeleton. Ah, so you mean during the ingression process? Yeah. Um, I mean, they, I think what perhaps what you're referring to is actually, is there actually sorting happening in, in the embryo? Do you have actually a, a mixture between ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm? And if I, perhaps I should go back and show you. Yeah, this might be. Okay, so, 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 uh, the, um, where did I put it here? Um, okay, um, if you look at this situation here, this is really the ingression process, right? And, you know, it, it doesn't, it's not a salt and pepper. You don't have ectoderm randomly intermixed with mesoderm and endoderm, and then they're segregating out. What you have is actually, you have a population of cells up here which has been uh, ectoderm, and they receive now a signal which comes from the York cell and makes these cells more and more mesoderm and endoderm. So there's a sort of continuous transformation of these cells into a different cell fate. And once they are mesoderm and endoderm up here, and they're expressing markers typically for mesoderm and endoderm, then they are moving to the inside. My saying that is what I think the differential surface tension is doing is keeping these two layers apart from each other rather than actually driving the ingression process. I think the ingression process is more driven by these cells becoming migratory, mesenchymal, and then actually migrating to the inside, right? So, so the, sec the, the involution or ingression process seems to be more driven by a form of active cell migration. Once they are on the inside, you have, you have to make sure that they are not just going back to the tissue they're coming from. And this separation of the different germ layers might be driven by differences in surface tension between these tissues. Okay, so that's actually very precise. I mean, you know, I, I think that's the most honest version here of what, what is happening in there. Yeah. Uh, if mesoderm can become ectoderm again, or um, yeah, uh, it's in again. I mean, I could talk about it, but I'm not sure. Perhaps I can do it on Wednesday. Is you know how the different cell fates are being induced, mesoderm and endoderm, how they are being maintained once these cells are on the inside. And one critical factor which allows mesoderm cells to remain mesoderm once they're going to the inside is actually cell cell contacts. They have to adhere to each other, and there has to be some form of autocrine or paracrine signaling between cells which allows them to maintain their, ectoderm, their mesoderm and endoderm cell fates. If you keep them in isolation, they become eventually, again, they lose their mesoderm fate and they, become, they could potentially become ectoderm again. But once these cells are going to the inside, they are in contact with each other, uh, and, and they are signaling going on between these cells, which, you know, sort of maintains and promotes their cell fate they have acquired in the germ uh, in the In the self-organization essay? Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so here I have to go into technical details. What we do here is we induce a stable population of mesoderm cells, which express actually the mesoderm inducing factor by themselves. It's a nodal TGA beta signal. These cells will always remain mesoderm, no matter what, right? If they're in contact or, or not, it doesn't matter, because they're expressing so much of the stuff which induces them in the first place that they will always remain mesoderm and endoderm. The other cells which you have taken as ectoderm are cells from a mutant which cannot respond to mesoderm and um, to the uh, mesoderm endoderm inducing factor nodal. And they will always remain ectoderm because they are just insensitive to any factor which would put induce mesoderm and endoderm in these. So it's sort of an artificial assay which allows us to keep them completely separate and have no switch in cell fate during the segregation process. Okay, so how much time do I have left? 
half an hour. So I can try to tell you a bit about cell migration as well. <coughs> 40 minutes? Okay, that should be enough. Um, <coughs> Okay, so I want to tell you a bit about mechanical analysis cell migration and development, and specifically, uh, you know, I wanted to introduce um, uh, the, the types of cell migration you see in the embryo. And again, we are looking now at the mesoderm and endoderm, which has gone to the inside after ingression, and we are looking how mesoderm and endoderm progenitor cells are migrating on the yolk cell between the ectoderm on the outside and the yolk cell on the inside, right? And you can see very nicely these cells as they are migrating up. It's a sheet, a coherent sheet of cells collectively undergoing migration, with cells at the leading edge being very protrusive, right? And, you know, what we wanted to understand in this study is how, sub, you know, migration is being triggered in the embryo and which different types of migration you have in the embryo. This very much looks like a mesenchymal type of migration where cells are forming uh, active rich protrusions, lamellopodia, phyllopodia, and they're crawling over the, the, you know, either using the ectoderm or the yolk cell as a substrate, and they're crawling and, and moving forward. How fast, how fast are they migrating? Up to two micrometer per minute. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so in the high magnification, we're looking now at these cells which are coming to the inside and are migratory, and now this cluster of cells just moving from the left to the right side in this movie here, and I have um, got an eye, Alba, uh, the PhD student in the lab has done this. Uh, she labeled the plasma membrane in red and actin in green, just to show which kind of protrusions are being formed when these cells are migrating. You might be able to see here these kind of lamellopodia, uh, green protrusions up here, but you also see occasionally these membrane blaps. You can see it now. I think there's one forming down here. There's a black forming. So you have all sorts of different types of protrusions. You have more actin rich, lamellopodia, pseudopodia. Phyllopodia protrusions, and then you have these um, the initially actin devoid membrane blaps, which repolymerize actin, and then these blaps are being pulled back, right? So I would say lamellopodia, phyllopodia, and blaps are the most frequent protrusion types. You can quantify that during the migration. Again, you're looking here at a, a blap, which would be a membrane without actin <laughs> initially. <laughs> Excuse me. And then uh, a phyllopodium containing actin, and a lamellopodium, which is filled with actin, a very broad, uh, you know, flat sheet. <coughs> and if you look at the percentage of these different protrusion types, surprisingly, the blaps are the most frequent ones, followed by lamellopodia and then phyllopodia in these types of migration, once these mesoderm cells are going to the inside. We're actually looking here at axial, anterior axial mesoderm cells, just for, for the sake of completeness. Okay, so what we want to know is we want to find a way how we can change the um, distribution of uh, protrusions and see if changing the distribution would have an effect on the migratory ability of these cells, assuming that they might have specific functions in migration, right? And what we did is we increased further the percentage of flaps at the expense of lamellopodia and phyllopodia. And the way we are doing it is genetically interfering with a molecule um, which is called esrin. And esrin couples the uh, act um, actomyosin cortex to the plasma membrane. And we can downregulate esrin by using antisense morpholino oligonucleotides or using a dominant negative version of esrin. In this case, we are reducing cortical to plasma membrane attachment. And then reducing that, we're getting an increased number of blaps at the expense of lamellopodia and phyllopodia in these cells. And what we found when we are doing these experiments is, I'm not sure whether the computer is doing this all the time, is um, uh, um, that the uh, directional persistence of these cells is going down, then we are treating them with dominant negative estrogen and estrogen morpholinos. And, okay. and the net speed is going down. So these cells are migrating in a less directional ma manner and they're migrating slower um, once we have more blaps um, at the expense of lamellopodia and phyllopodia, indicating that for um, directed and fast migration, these cells need lamellopodia and phyllopodia. And once we are switching uh, into blap like protrusions, they are not as directional and not as fast in their migratory activity. No. And um, I, I can tell you why. But, um, you know, th this was only a starting, you know, experiment into actually, you know, what we wanted to know is we wanted to uh, see how these different protrusion types are being formed. And um, what Verena in the lab then did is uh, she thought, uh, what we usually do is take cells out of the embryo, mesoderm and endoderm cells, put them into culture on different substrates and ask which protrusion can they form and how would these cells then migrate in, you know, in the presence of different protrusions. 
Now, this is what you have seen before already when, you know, in these pipette experiments, these circular blefs. Can you see that? This is what a cell, a progenitor cell, a mesoderm or endoderm progenitor cell, when you put it on a pyponectin coated substrate, this is what they do for a couple of hours. Very boring. They're just following this blep and it's called circus behavior. And they're just, you know, they're just not very adhesive and then they have this blep like protrusion font which is circulating around there. And it can go counter, counterclockwise or clockwise, doesn't matter. Okay, so, so that, that was not particularly encouraging, but then what, the, uh, what Verena did then is she increased, she improved the culture conditions by changing the fibronectin subset in which these cells are sitting. And if she made it long enough, then what, what was happening is that these cells, which were usually just forming this boring blap, circulating blap, they're, bec they're becoming now more adhesive. And you can see that they are forming these chains of migratory cells, which looks more, what it, you know, more like what is happening within the embryo, where you have migrating cells moving as a sort of a, a cohesive uh, sheet of cells, right? So you can get something which looks a bit closer to what uh, cells will do. Then she did one experiment. This was basically done by accident. She added serum to the medium. Usually we, you know, do all these studies in serum-free culture medium. And she added serum to these cells. I'll just show you what then happened is, and she can add you know, a serum component, LPA. And what is happening then is this. This would be the, you know, these mesenchymal migratory cells. Now she added serum, and what she found is a complete transformation of these cells, which we have never seen before. You can see it now, whoops. And you know, in this case, it is acting, all the acting is gonna be at the back of these cells, and they have a very large blep-like protrusion front, a very stable blep-like protrusion front. That really happens instantaneously when you increase cortical contactivity by adding serum or you know, LPA to the medium. So that was quite interesting, and she got quite interested in that. I was very skeptical if that has any uh, you know, meaningful uh, relation to what is happening within the embryo. What she then did is she described these cells in a bit more detail. What she found is that you know, what you've seen before in this movie is um, that actin goes to the back end, predominantly accumulates in the back end of these cells, and then they have this stable lab-like protrusion in the front end, which seems to be largely devoid of, of actin and myosin. This is a typical appearance in a, in a um, DSC image here of these cells, where all the stuff is on the back, and the front is, is a, a huge balloon in the front, which is very, very stable. So, so the first thing she asked then is, how would this polarity emerge in these cells? And what she did is, um, and you know, the first thing is she determined the, um, the dynamics of uh, this polarization process. And uh, what she did is she, she takes one of these cultures, which uh, consists of mesenchymal cells, which have lamellopodia and palopodia, and then she adds a time point zero LPA to the, to the medium in very small concentrations. And then she's asking how quick these cells are polarizing. And within 10 minutes, a very large proportion of these cells have uh, transformed into these stable black like cells. So essentially, if you wait for long enough, all of these cells transform from this mesenchyma state into this weird stable black um, uh, morphology, as you can see up here. And this is simply done by increasing cortical actomyosin contactivity. The, the reason why we believe so is that LPA is a known ligand which binds to a G-protein coupled receptor, and this G-protein coupled receptor, this LPA receptor, signals via G-proteins into rho gap, rho A, and then it um, acts on to actin polymerization and or actomyosin uh, contraction. So we thought this branch of the LPA pathway is presumably what we activate in these cells. And the reason why we believe so is shown in this experiment. What she did here is she did the same what she has done before. She has a control culture where all the cells are essentially non-polarized mesenchymal cells. Then she's adding LPA, and she can transform a very large proportion of these cells into these stable BLEP cells. And if she's doing the same experiment with blebistatin or with a, a, a rho kinase inhibitor or depolarizing actin, she can inhibit this, she can basically inhibit this transformation, right? Indicating this, this transformation depends on actomyosin contactivity in these cells. Yeah. I, I come to that. We can, for example, we can just activate rho A and you know take a considered active form of rho A, and you, you see the same essentially in in a, in a shortcut. So it all smells like you know increasing uh, cortical contactivity, but by whatever means, right? Serum, LPA, various ways. You you get you arrive at the same effect that you can transform these cells efficiently from a mesenchymal into a stable blood-like cell. Um, 
uh, but she then wants to know is how this um, um, how this polarization um, relies on myosin two and actin redistribution in the cell. And what she finds here is that if you see that myosin two goes all to the back of these cells, and you have this very stable myosin two free from them, which you know she called a stable plant. So myosin two goes to the back end during this polarization process, and um, uh, so, so she gets a, a very strong cortical enrichment of myosin 2 in the back end of these cells. So what she uh, speculated here is that there's, you know, depending on the, you know, an increasing uh, increasing cortical conductivity, you can transform non-polarized cells, which are mesenchymal, in this case they are just non-cells, into either cells which are dynamically blabbing at medium conductivity levels, into a cell which has one protrusive stable front blab at very high conductivity levels, right? So you go from a mesenchymal cell into a spontaneous blabbing cell into a stable blab cell, depending on the level of cortical conductivity you have in these cells. And um, what she wanted then to know is um, if she can induce this polarization by locally triggering cortical conductivity. And the way she's doing it, she's taking a pipette, she blows LPA onto one end of these cells, and usually what is happening is that at the end she blows uh, this LPA in this case, but she can use serum as well. Myosin 2 is accumulating, and this protrusive, fr this um, left front end points away from the pipette. So, in principle, you can polarize these cells by locally strongly activating cortical conductivity in these cells. Then you get, you know, uh, you, you can determine the polarity of these cells. She also wanted to know if there are um, different ways of uh, um, triggering cortical conductivity in one way, which has been demonstrated by Mathieu Piel in, in, in an accompanying study in, in Paris. He showed that if you take cells from you know, different cell lines and you strongly compress them, put, put them under spatial confinement, you trigger actomyosin conductivity in these cells, and you actually can transform them into some, something like these cells. He showed that independently. So we thought if, you know, perhaps you can do it independently of LPA or serum or you know, activating rho A, but just putting them under spatial confinement. And that's exactly what we are finding when we are putting them under strong spatial confinement. You can transform them into the stable blab cell with a back end. I mean, they, they're quite squeezed in this case, but you can reliably do exactly the same what Mathieu has shown for, for different cell types. Now, we wanted to know if this transformation depends on a certain cell fate in the embryo. So we took uh, ectoderm cells, mesoderm cells, and endoderm cells, and we compared their ability to transform under, you know, the, in the presence of LPA by increasing cortical conductivity. And the take-home message is it doesn't matter what these cells are. If they're mesoderm, ectoderm, or endoderm, irrespective of their primary cell fate, you can always trigger a, a large degree of transformation in these cells by simply upregulating cortical conductivity. So it's not a cell fate. It doesn't depend on the on the um, on the on the fate of these cells. Now, the the question really she was interested in is migration, and she wanted to know if these cells. Yeah. There are cases that the drosophila mesons there. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of lactobacin that drives that because of constriction. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Invent the full formation then, yeah. Mm -hmm. So do you think that is, they not become migratory right away? Because, I mean, is there another signal in which you could do apical constriction first and then migration in this context? Or is just probably the level are not high enough? So, so you're wondering why in Drosophila under high cortical conductivity levels these cells are not becoming uh, um, these cells. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that the difference, the first difference is that all these cells we are looking at here are non-epithelial cells, right? These are non-prop epithelial cells. We're looking at some form of mesenchymal cells from, to start with, right? Um, and interestingly, the only cell type in the embryo which you cannot transform into a stable blab cell are these outside EVL enveloping layer cells, which are the only truly epithelial cells. So from an epithelium to go into these stable blab cells, it's quite hard. I mean, that doesn't work very well. Like because of the epigabasal polarization, I think, and, you know, perhaps the adherence junctions, which makes it harder. Um, Okay, so we want to know how these stable blood cells would migrate, and you know what uh, what is well known in migrating cells that um, actin is being polymerized to the front end, and then you have a backflow of actin, which is resisted by the friction to the outside environment of these cells, which leads to the protrusive force of actin pushing forward. Right? I mean, that's the general model of uh, um, this uh, um, um, actin polymerization backflow, retrograd flow, triggering migration. So she wanted to see if they, you know, how actin and myosin dynamically distribute. And you can see in these cells here that you have a very fast flow of actin, 
which is between 20 and 30 micrometer per minute um, to the back of these cells, right? I mean, you have a very, you know, there's a con uh, continuous polymerization, myosin as well. You see these myosin mini filaments flowing backwards in these uh, stable type cells, right? Um, and that already, you know, sort of indicates that these cells have a potential of migrating. You just need to put them in the right environment where there's some friction where they could actually migrate. So what she did is um, she quantified these flows in the first place, but then she put them in confinement. And she not just puts them sitting on a, on one month substrate, but she puts them in a, in a certain confinement where she puts an agarose plate up here and the glass down here. And when they have some friction to the agarose and to the glass down, down there, then you can actually get them into a migratory phase. And I'll show you that here. Now these cells are becoming migratory, and they're migrating actually very, very fast. These cells in culture migrate up to 20, 30 micrometer per minute. This is more than 10 times as fast as you would find a single cell in the embryo tumor. That's something that looks weird, right? But they are super fast, and that depends on and, and scales with, the, with uh, the degree of actomyosin flow, backward flow you have in these cells. You have a very fast actomyosin backward flow, which is resisted by some friction to the outside medium and then propels these cells forward, right? Like a caterpillar to a certain degree. Okay. So um, now, if you uh, have a stationary cell which is glued here, then you know, and it's not in confinement, then you just have this flow, and this flow is not resisted by any friction, and this is a cell which is migrating, and where you have where you have a fast flow uh, resulting into a forward motion of these cells when they are not sticking to anything and when they are confined on both sides. Okay, so, so the, the type of migration they are doing seems to be a persistent random walk. And essentially what, what, what is happening when these cells are migrating in one direction, they hardly change their uh, direction anymore. And it's very hard to steer them. You cannot give them any chemokine. They would not change their direction. Once they're running, they're running in the same direction. Roughly. Okay, and the mean speed is something between 15 and 20 micrometer per minute, very, very fast. Okay, so, so the, the, up to that, up to this point, I mean, one thing she, she wanted to see is, do these cells need any specific adhesion? Do they need any sort of, uh, you know, uh, matrix adhesion, integrin-mediated matrix adhesion for migration of these cells? So what is the effect that gives this persistence? <coughs> you must have some, I mean, it looks like you might have a bistable system in which once you make a cell, it's not easy to translate. So do you know where that's coming from? Um, it's, it's, I mean, what is happening is you have some spontaneous polarization of these cells, assuming that there's no local contractility um, induction in these cells. And once they have chosen a direction, they just run along this path. And the, the way they run within, you know, I can show you that later in, you know, in the endogenous environment, is they're looking for space. They run where there's space. And if there's no space, they just stop. Right? I mean, they go to more space, essentially. And this um, I mean, then you have this very fast, uh, I, mean, the, I mean, how would you steer them? You would steer them by some chemokine signaling or something, right? But I don't think there's, you know, you, you never see any accumulation of any membrane proteins at the front end of these cells because everything flows very fast backwards, right? If, you know, look at integrins or anything, it's all sort of, you know, halfway back where the cell is, you know, where the, where the stuff is starting to accumulate. But at the front end, you hardly have anything really stably attached to the plasma membrane because the cortex is constantly flowing very fast backwards. So I don't think molecularly you have anything which could, you know, could build a like sensory a complex, a receptor complex, which would, you know, allow the cell to steer really there. I mean, that's the, the simplest explanation here. Um, exactly. So I think there's a continuous polymerization of actin and, and, and you know, myosin intercalation. And, and this network, once it is polymerized, it's really starting to flow back, right? So the continuous polymerization and backflow at the same time. If you put actin and myosin together, what do you mean? Yeah, exactly. Ah, you see that um, myosin is in between actin filaments, right, and seem to seem to anchor to the actin filaments, but it's not directly overlapping. But it's you know it's somehow flowing together, you know, at the same speed as the actin cells. So. Ah, so if it's more, you mean more in cortical areas or in the bulk? Um, I mean, I assume it has to be some. I mean, there has to be some backflow as well, right? I mean, if it flows in one direction, you need some backflow in the middle. 
I think what she has done here, this is um, right at the, it's turf microscopy, so it's probably more on the, on the cortex rather than the middle of the cell she's imaging here. I guess so. there must be some forward flow, right? I mean, there must be some sort of compensatory flow for the back flow you have on the, on the outside side. Okay, so, so, so one, one question she asked is, do you need any specific integrin mediated adhesion? And what she found, and this was quite interesting, if that will work. Uh -huh. so, so if you put cells on different substrates, you can put them either on uh, um, polylysin, or you can put them on fibronectin, or you can put them on VSP, uh, BSA. In all these cases, it seems to be that specific Adhesion to extracellular matrix is actually slowing down their migration. And the best is if you're putting them on PEC, you know, um, passivated substrates where, you know, specific adhesion is being actually minimized. There they actually love to, and they, they run fastest. And as soon as you introduce specific adhesion, they, they, this slows down their migration speed. So, so the only thing they need is spatial confinement, high cortical contractility, and low unspecific adhesion to a substrate. And then they are really fast. Everything else is, is slowing it down. Okay, so, so what, we, what we learned from that is that it depends on spatial confinement, it's independent of specific adhesion, and substrates filled with fibronectin, polylysin, and VSA uh, do only uh, slow it down. And it's independent of endogenous cateron expression and endogenous integrin beta 1 expression in these cells. Now, the, the obvious question is is that all a, you know, a culture artifact, or is there any meaning for the actual situation within the embryo? Do these cells exist? So, so what, um, uh, what it is, we went through many, many movies we recorded over the last 15 years. Yeah? Sorry? Um, it's in the back end, um, but not directly sitting, not really on the back end, but perhaps, you know, in the last third of the cell. Okay, so we want to know, do these cells actually exist? So what we did is we, we screened so all the movies we have recorded over the last 15 years on mesoderm and endoderm migration. And what we ended up is one movie, and this was just a complete accident. And look at this movie. We're looking again at mesoderm and endoderm cells migrating, and there's one cell coming on the left side, which we obviously ignored at this stage, which strikingly looks like a, you know, a stable blood cell. Very fast and migratory, and we you know, couldn't understand what the cell was actually doing, but you know, that sort of indicated that these cells might actually exist within the embryo. So I asked a Japanese uh, postdoc Hitoshi um, to um, actually start recording many, many movies and see if he can actually find these cells in different conditions within the embryo. And what he um, then consistently uh, found is actually that these cells exist. And you can see another cell, I think it's migrating here now, very fast, um, you know, BP mesoderm, ectoderm. And he did many of these movies, and you know, he consistently finds that there's spontaneous emergence of these cells within the embryo at random locations. It's hard to predict where they would emerge, but you do um, find them in the uh, actual uh, situation within, uh, during gestation, in this case, here within the embryo. Now, he wanted to have a way he can actually induce them uh, in the embryo to see if, you know, cortical contractility is actually involved. And what he did is uh, a very simple experiment where he uh, looks at, you know, the blastoderm of, uh, you know, a pre stage embryo, and he induces a little lesion wound up here. And when you're wounding the embryo, you trigger cortical contractility for wound closure. And what he found is when he's doing these experiments is that he actually can trigger these cells. You see that? There's one cell running through here, and there's another one over there, right? So by simply upregulating cortical contractility through so this wounding, he can actually induce these cells within the embryo. Um, he can also, and, and, and that's another experiment, where he used a constitutive active version of Rho-A, just upregulating Rho-A activity and loose actomyosin contractility in these cells. He can actually transform cells within the embryo. I think that's shown in this movie here. Here you have one of these cells, uh, which um, is overexpressing constitutive active Rho-A. The cell speed of these cells is much faster than any other cell within the embryo. Again, it's a bit, it's a bit uh, slower than what we see in culture, but it goes up to 10 micrometer per minute. And if you look at myosin 2 localization, of course, it's harder to see within the embryo, but you see a uh, backflow of myosin in this case here, which looks similar to what you see in, in, in culture, where you have this consistent, <coughs> very fast backflow of active myosin in these migrating cells, stable lab cells. <coughs> Okay, so, so we, we know that these cells exist in vivo. 
and the obvious question is, you know, in which sort of uh, environment could they actually, you know, be physiologically relevant? What, what is their function? The short answer is uh, we don't know what their function is in vivo, but there are different possibilities how they could function. One possibility would be if you do a wound, uh, wounding, uh, um, you know, where you, where you actually uh, um, injure the embryo, what you usually get is a wound closure. You get a contraction of cells and a very high density of cells. In one way, you can reduce this high local and um, this uh, local high density of cells would be um, dissipating cells out of the wounding area. So you could, one function could be that you induce this very fast migratory mode by getting rid of cells out of the wounding area and redistribute them in the, uh, in, in, in the area. Another sort of interesting um, observation came by talking to cancer cell biologists. And they told us when they looked at our movies that they look strikingly similar to metastatic cells um, leaving primary tumors. And they were very excited about it, and they're still very excited about it. Is what we did then, we uh, did one, we wanted to see if we can mimic a primary tumor in, in, in the embryo. And what we did is we did here an explant, and we're pressing on the explant, treating it with LPN. And we can occasionally see cells leaving at the margin of these uh, um, uh, uh, explants and actually showing the stable blast migration by simply you know, having you know, a large aggregate of cells, treating them with high conductivity. And then at the edge, you can transform cells into these stable blast cells. So one possibility might be, and that's something uh, uh, other people are looking into now, is that uh, in the primary tumor you uh, um, trigger local actomizing contractility, which leads to some of these cells transforming into these uh, stable blep cells, leaving the primary tumor, migrating as single cells, and being metastatic. OK. Um, so, so what I want to conclude on that is that progenitor cells in culture can be transformed into a novel fast migratory amoebate cell type that uses the stable blep like protrusions. This transformation is independent of the primary cell fate. It doesn't matter if they're mesoderm, endoderm, or ectoderm. And their migration mode before, if they are blebbing or mesenchymal. And their amoebate cells migrate faster than any other cell in the embryo. And, and this depends strictly on spatial confinement. And it's independent of specific adhesion. And that's it. Thank <laughs> you.